It was a humid summer evening when my friends and I felt gathered in our usual spot, the, 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 dim, the dimly lit back corner of the local diner. We were swapping ghost stories when someone mentioned the old Whitmore house, the rickety structure at the end of Willow Street. I had heard whispers about it before, stories of strange noises, flickering lights, and shadowy figures that appeared at the windows late at night. Intrigued, I leaned in closer. You know, I said, a thrill coursing through me, I've always wanted to check it out. We should go tonight. My friends exchanged nervous glances, but the adrenaline in the air was palpable. Before long, we had decided a late night adventure to explore the haunted Whitmore house. As we approached the house, the full moon hung low in the sky, casting an eerie glow over the dilapidated structure. The wooden boards creaked ominously under our feet as we crossed the threshold. The front door groaned open, revealing a darkened foyer that smelled of damp and decay. We hesitated, the excitement of exploration quickly mingling with a sense of foreboding. Inside, the air was heavy, thick with the weight of unspoken histories. Shadows danced along the walls, and as I flicked my flashlight around the room, I could see faded family portraits staring back at us, their expressions frozen in time. I felt a shiver run down my spine, but curiosity pushed me forward. Let's check the living room, Clara suggested, her voice barely above a whisper. We followed her lead, our footsteps echoing in the silence. The living room was a hodgepodge of old furniture, draped in sheets that looked like ghosts in their own right. A fireplace dominated one wall, its mantle covered in dust and cobwebs. Suddenly I heard a faint noise, a soft, almost imperceptible whisper that floated through the air. I turned to my friends, who looked equally confused. Did you hear that? I asked, my heart racing. They nodded, wide-eyed. Maybe it's just the wind, Jake offered but I could hear the uncertainty in his voice. We ventured deeper into the house, each room revealing more layers of neglect. As we explored, the whispering grew louder, rising and falling like a ghostly lullaby. The walls seemed to close in on us, and I couldn't shake the feeling that we weren't alone. As we reached the kitchen, Clara froze, her eyes fixed on a doorway leading down to the basement. I think we should check it out, she said, her voice trembling. No way, Jake replied, backing away. Basements are never a good idea. We should just go. But I felt an undeniable pull toward the staircase. Something about the darkness below beckoned me. I'll go first, I said, stepping forward despite my friend's protests. As I descended the stairs, the air grew colder, and the whispering escalated into a cacophony of hushed voices, echoing off the damp stone walls. At the bottom, I fumbled for my flashlight, the beam flickering across the basement's concrete floor. The light fell on an old trunk in the corner its surface covered in a thick layer of dust. I approached it, heart pounding, the whispers now forming words I couldn't quite understand. Guys, come here, I called out, but my voice felt small in the oppressive darkness. Clara and Jake reluctantly followed, peering over my shoulder. What is it? Clara asked, her breath hitching. Look at this trunk, I said, brushing off the dust. I lifted the heavy lid and the hinges creaked like a warning. Inside, I found an assortment of forgotten items, yellowed newspapers, a cracked mirror, and a small, delicate porcelain doll, its eyes eerily lifelike. As I reached for the doll, a chilling gust of wind swept through the basement, extinguishing my flashlight and plunging us into darkness. Panic surged as I fumbled to turn it back on, the whispers crescendoing into a dissonant chorus. When the light flickered back to life, I gasped. The doll was gone, replaced by a twisted figure crouching in the corner. It was small, too small to be human, with long spindly limbs and a face obscured by shadows. I could feel its gaze on me, a penetrating stare that seemed to reach into my very soul. Run! I shouted, and we bolted back up the stairs, adrenaline fueling our flight. The whispers grew louder, morphing into cries, begging for release, for recognition. The house shook around us, walls trembling as if in anger, and I could feel the cold breath of something close behind us. We burst through the front door and stumbled into the night, gasping for air. The old Whitmore house loomed ominously behind us, its windows dark and foreboding. I glanced back, and for a brief moment I thought I saw the figure standing at the window, its features twisted in a grotesque smile. What the hell was that? Jake gasped, his face pale. I don't know, I panted, my heart racing. But we have to leave. Now. We ran down Willow Street the whispers still echoing in my mind, taunting me with their haunting melody. I could feel the weight of the house pressing on my shoulders, uh, its stories lingering in the air like smoke. That night marked the end of our explorations. 
the Whitmore house became a dark memory, a chilling reminder of what lay in the shadows. I couldn't shake the feeling that the whispers had followed me home, a reminder that some places should remain untouched, their secrets left buried in the silence. Weeks passed, but the nightmares returned. The figure haunted my dreams, its hollow eyes staring into my soul. I learned that the Whitmore house had once belonged to a family who had mysteriously vanished, their fate unknown. The whispers in the dark now felt like a warning, a plea for someone to listen, to remember. In the years since, I have never returned to Willow Street. The old house remains, an echo of a dark past that still lingers in the town. And every time I walk by, I can hear the whispers in the wind calling out from the silent house at the end of the street. Story end. Story number two. It was one of those dreary autumn afternoons, the kind where the clouds hang low and heavy, smothering the sun. I just moved into a small, ramshackle house uh, on the outskirts of Cedar Grove, a sleepy little town with a reputation for its local legends and ghostly tales. At first, I thought the creaking floors and howling winds were just the house settling, but I quickly learned that Cedar Grove had secrets. Dark secrets. After unpacking my last box, I decided to take a stroll through the nearby woods, eager to shake off the feeling that something was off. As I walked, the trees loomed over me, their twisted branches clawing at the gray sky. A chill settled around me and I couldn't help but feel as if I was being watched. Shaking it off, I continued until I stumbled upon a clearing. In the center stood a dilapidated cabin, vines wrapping around it like skeletal fingers. Against my better judgment, curiosity pulled me closer. As I approached, I felt an unmistakable weight in the air, like a blanket of dread. I pushed open the door, which creaked eerily on its hinges, revealing a dark, dust-covered interior. The moment I stepped inside, a shiver ran down my spine, and I felt a presence, something dark and malevolent. I quickly backed out, my heart racing. As I turned to leave, I caught a glimpse of something in the corner of my eye, a shadow darting past the window. I froze, my breath hitching in my throat. I wasn't alone. Without thinking, I bolted back to my house, heart pounding. That night, I tried to shake off the feeling of dread that clung to me like a second skin. As darkness enveloped Cedar Grove, I settled into bed, pulling the covers tight. But sleep wouldn't come. Every creak of the house made my heart race. Every gust of wind sent chills racing down my spine. Around midnight, I was jolted awake by a loud bang from downstairs. The sound echoed through the silence, followed by a dragging noise. Fear gripped me as I slowly climbed out of bed, the floorboards groaning beneath my weight. I grabbed my flashlight and crept toward the stairs, every step feeling like a descent into hell. As I reached the bottom, I felt a cold breeze whip past me, and my flashlight flickered. I could see the front door slightly ajar, swaying back and forth. The hairs on my neck stood on end. I stepped closer, peering outside into the inky darkness, but nothing was there. Just then, a whisper echoed through the house, soft and indistinct at first, but growing louder, more insistent. Get out! It was a raspy voice filled with malice. I stumbled back, panic clawing at my throat. I turned to run back upstairs, but as I did, I caught sight of something in the corner of my eye, a figure standing in the shadows, shrouded in darkness. I froze, my breath hitching as I focused on the figure. It was a woman, her face pale and gaunt, her eyes sunken and hollow. She wore a tattered dress, and her long, tangled hair hung around her like a veil. She was staring directly at me, her expression twisted in anguish. I could feel her pain, her desperation, and it chilled me to the bone. Leave this place, she whispered, her voice echoing in my mind. You don't belong here. Without thinking, I bolted back up the stairs, slamming the bedroom door behind me. I pressed my back against it, heart racing, listening for any sign of her. Silence enveloped the room, but I knew I couldn't let my guard down. I grabbed my phone and called the local sheriff, my voice trembling as I explained what had happened. Listen, it's probably just your imagination. Cedar Grove has a lot of stories, but there's nothing to worry about, he said dismissively, his tone laced with disbelief. Just stay inside tonight. I'll send someone to check on you in the morning. That did little to comfort me. As I hung up, I glanced at the window, and my stomach dropped. The woman was standing there, her face pressed against the glass, her eyes wide with terror. I could feel her sorrow washing over me, suffocating me. I wanted to scream, to run, but my body felt paralyzed. Then she raised a hand, and I could see it was bloodied, as if she had clawed her way through something. You need to leave, she pleaded again, her voice rising in pitch, before it's too late. In that moment I understood, I had to leave Cedar Grove. 
whatever haunted this place was not going to let me go easily. I darted to my bag, throwing in essentials, not daring to look out the window again. I could hear her voice growing more frantic, urging me to escape. I bolted back downstairs, my heart racing. The front door swung open as if inviting me to step into the night. But as I stepped outside, the air grew thick with darkness. I could feel it closing in, could feel the malevolent presence surrounding me. The woman's voice echoed in my mind, growing louder with each step I took toward my car. Just as I reached my vehicle, a sharp pain pierced my chest and I fell to my knees. The darkness swirled around me and I could see the woman standing there pleading, her eyes filled with tears. You can't stay. You can't stay. With one last ounce of strength, I staggered to my feet and fumbled with my keys, desperately unlocking the car. I dove inside, slamming the door shut behind me. I could feel the weight of her presence pressing against the glass, her fingers ghostly and pale. As I sped away from Cedar Grove, I dared a glance in the rearview mirror. She was still there, standing in the road, her silhouette fading into the night. I didn't stop until I reached the nearest town, my heart still pounding. I thought I was free, but the memory of her haunted me, a chilling reminder of the darkness lurking in Cedar Grove. Now, whenever I hear a whisper in the wind or feel the cold touch of night, I remember her warning. Cedar Grove isn't just a town, it's a graveyard of souls lost to the darkness. And once you enter, you may never leave. Story the end. Story number three. Every small town has its share of urban legends, but none are as terrifying as the one I grew up hearing about. The Shadow Man. They said he roamed the streets at night, lurking in the corners of your vision, only to vanish when you turned to look. He preyed on the unsuspecting, stealing their joy and leaving behind only despair. Most brushed it off as just a story to frighten children, but my encounters with him turned those tales into a living nightmare. It all started when I was a teenager, just old enough to be left home alone while my parents worked late. It was the perfect opportunity to enjoy some freedom, but the very first night they were gone, I felt a creeping unease settle over the house. Shadows danced in the corners of my vision, and I kept glancing at the clock, waiting for it to tick down the hours until I could finally go to bed. That evening, I decided to distract myself with horror movies, thinking that if I surrounded myself with the fictional, I could chase away the real fear. As the sun set and darkness enveloped the room, I lost myself in the on-screen chaos, laughing nervously at the jump scares. But the moment the last credits rolled, a chill swept through the house, extinguishing my laughter. I decided to check the windows, thinking the wind had picked up. As I moved from room to room, I felt a sudden drop in temperature as if the air had thickened. I brushed it off, convincing myself I was just letting my imagination run wild. But deep down, I knew something wasn't right. I finally settled back on the couch, hoping that if I stayed still, I would convince myself that I was safe. Just as I began to relax, a noise broke the silence, a soft, scratching sound coming from the hallway. It was faint, but unmistakable. My heart raced as I held my breath, straining to hear. I slowly got up, my legs trembling as I made my way toward the noise. Each step felt like a descent into some unseen horror. I peered down the hallway, and that's when I saw him. A figure stood at the end of the corridor, shrouded in darkness, its form indistinct but undeniably present. The only thing I could make out was a pair of glowing eyes fixed on me, piercing through the shadows. I froze, paralyzed with fear. The stories flooded my mind, the warning of the shadow man, and the dread of what he could do. Just as I opened my mouth to scream, the figure moved. It glided towards me, its movements smooth and almost fluid, as if it was gliding on air. I stumbled back, my heart pounding in my ears. Suddenly, it stopped, and for a moment, the air felt heavy, oppressive. I could hear my pulse thrumming in my head, the silence deafening. Then, just as quickly as it appeared, the figure vanished into thin air, I get, leaving me standing alone in the hallway, my breath quickening as I gasped for air. Panicking, I raced back to the living room, locking the door behind me. I sat on the couch, clutching my phone, desperately trying to convince myself it was just a trick of the light. I tried to focus on anything but what I had just seen. I turned on the TV, hoping the noise would drown out the silence, but the shadows in the corners felt alive, watching, waiting. Hours passed, and I felt the exhaustion creeping in, my eyelids growing heavy. I knew I should call my parents, tell them about the shadow man, but I didn't want to sound crazy. Just as I was about to drift off, the scratching noise returned, this time louder and more insistent. Fear gripped me, and I felt the urge to look, to face whatever was haunting me. 
I reluctantly stood up, my heart hammering in my chest. As I stepped into the hallway, the scratching stopped, replaced by a low, guttural growl that echoed through the darkness. Get out! The voice was distorted and echoed as if it were coming from the walls themselves. My blood ran cold as I realized it wasn't just a voice. It was a chorus of whispers, each one pleading for me to leave. I bolted back to the living room, fumbling for my phone. I had to call someone, anyone, but my hands shook so violently that I couldn't dial. That's when the lights flickered and went out, plunging me into darkness. I could feel the weight of something pressing in around me, the shadows swirling like a living entity. Then I heard it, the unmistakable sound of footsteps, slow and deliberate, advancing toward me. I was trapped in my own home, a prisoner of the very place I had thought would keep me safe. With a surge of adrenaline, I bolted for the front door, heart racing. I twisted the handle, but it wouldn't budge. The shadows danced around me, taunting, whispering my name, pulling me into their abyss. You're not going anywhere. I turned to face the darkness to confront whatever lay in the shadows. But instead, I saw the shadow man, standing there with a grin that sent chills down my spine. His form shifted, twisting in and out of focus, the glowing eyes piercing into my soul. He raised a hand, beckoning me closer, and I felt a wave of despair wash over me. Join us, he hissed, the voices of the damned swirling around him. In that moment, I understood. The Shadow Man wasn't just a legend. He was real, a collector of lost souls who had fallen into his grasp. I knew I had to escape, to break free from this nightmare. With one final surge of strength, I threw myself against the door, pushing with every ounce of energy I had. It gave way, and I tumbled into the night, the cool air refreshing against my skin. I could hear the whispers fading behind me as I ran into the street, not stopping until I reached a neighbor's house, banging frantically on their door. They let me in, confusion etched on their faces as I spilled my story, but all I could think of was the darkness behind me. I never returned to that house. My parents sold it shortly after, and I moved far away, trying to escape the memories of that night. But even now, years later, I can still feel the weight of the Shadow Man's presence, lurking just beyond the edges of my vision. I know he's still out there, waiting for someone else to step into the darkness. And if you ever find yourself alone in a house at night, remember this. Shadows are not just tricks of the light. They can be something far more sinister. Story number four. I never believed in ghosts until I moved into the old Victorian house on Willow Street. It was a steal, too good to be true, but I was a college student on a tight budget, and the thought of having my own space thrilled me. The house had character, or so I told myself, despite its peeling paint and overgrown yard. I was too excited to care about the rumors of it being haunted. The first night, I felt a chill in the air, a cold draft that slithered through the hallways. I shrugged it off, blaming it on the old windows. But as I settled into bed, a soft whisper drifted through the darkness. I froze, straining to hear. It was almost melodic, the sound of someone speaking, but I couldn't make out the words. My heart raced, but I quickly dismissed it as my imagination running wild. Over the next few weeks, strange things began happening. At first, it was just little things. Doors that creaked open on their own, shadows flickering in the corner of my eye, and the sensation of being watched. I told myself it was just the house settling, but then came the whispers. They grew louder each night, echoing through the walls, like a conversation just out of reach. I often woke up in the middle of the night, staring into the dark, hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever was causing the noise. One particularly restless night, I decided to record the whispers on my phone. I placed the device on my bedside table, set it to record, and drifted off to sleep. In the morning, I excitedly listened to the audio, eager to hear what had been keeping me up. But when I played it back, my blood ran cold. Amid the ambient sounds of the night, I could hear distinct voices, two, maybe three, whispering urgently, their words muffled and unintelligible. My heart raced as I replayed it over and over, but no matter how many times I listened, I couldn't decipher what they were saying. I thought about calling someone, maybe a friend or my parents, but I didn't want to sound crazy. So I kept it to myself, convinced that the house was just old and quirky. The next night, I decided to investigate. Armed with my phone and a flashlight, I wandered the dark hallways, listening closely for the whispers. As I moved from room to room, I felt a heavy presence, a weight in the air that made my skin crawl. I stopped outside the living room, the door slightly ajar, and I could hear the whispers more clearly now. 
They were frantic, rising and falling like a conversation spiraling out of control. Help, please, find us. I swallowed hard, my heart racing. I pushed the door open, peering into the dimly lit room. The air was thick, almost electric, and the whispers intensified, swirling around me. I felt a cold breeze sweep past, and I gasped as I caught a glimpse of movement in the corner of my eye. A shadow darted past the window, too fast for me to see clearly. Get out, a voice hissed sharp and clear, cutting through the cacophony. I stumbled back, nearly tripping over my own feet as I bolted out of the room. I didn't stop until I was back in my bedroom, slamming the door shut behind me. My hands shook as I pressed my back against the wall, breathing heavily. I couldn't understand what was happening. I needed to leave, but I had nowhere else to go. That night, I barely slept. Every creak of the house made me jump. Every whisper sent chills racing down my spine. When dawn finally broke, I felt a strange mix of relief and dread. I decided to take a walk to clear my mind, hoping that the sunlight would chase away the darkness of the night. As I wandered through the neighborhood, I overheard a group of elderly women chatting on a porch. They were discussing the old Victorian house on Willow Street. I hesitated, then approached them. Curiosity peaked. Excuse me, I couldn't help but overhear you talking about that house, I said, trying to sound casual. Do you know anything about it? One of the women, her hair a silvery halo around her face, smiled knowingly. Ah, that place. It's had its share of trouble. People say it's haunted by the spirits of a family who lived there long ago. They disappeared without a trace. My heart dropped. What happened to them? They were never found, another woman chimed in, her voice low. They say if you listen closely, you can hear their pleas for help echoing through the walls. Some say they are trapped there, waiting for someone to find them. A chill ran down my spine. The whispers I had heard, the frantic voices, were they the spirits of that family? I could feel panic rising in me, but I forced myself to breathe. Why did they disappear? I asked, desperate for answers. Some say it was foul play. Others believe they were taken by the darkness that lurks in that house, the silver-haired woman replied. It's best to stay away, dear. I thanked them and hurried back home, my mind racing. I needed to get out. That night, I packed a few belongings, determined to leave by morning. As I prepared to call a friend to help me move, I heard it again, the whispers. This time, they were louder, more insistent. Help us. Please, find us. My heart pounded in my chest as I stumbled back, frozen in fear. The shadows in the room seemed to shift, and I could feel their cold presence surrounding me. I could no longer tell where the voices were coming from. They echoed from every direction. Leave. One voice shouted, its urgency making me jump. Get out while you can. In that moment, I realized I wasn't alone in the house. The spirits of the family were there, trapped and desperate, warning me of the darkness that had ensnared them. I could feel their anguish, their pain wrapping around me like a suffocating shroud. I raced for the front door, flinging it open, but as I stepped outside, the temperature dropped dramatically. The whispers grew louder, filled with a mixture of anger and despair. You cannot leave. You are one of us now. I felt something grab my ankle, pulling me back, the darkness clawing at me, dragging me toward the house. Panic surged through me, and with one final push, I broke free, sprinting down the street, not looking back until I reached the safety of a well-lit diner. Even now, as I sit here writing this, I can still hear the echoes of their pleas. I eventually left that town, but I can't shake the feeling that the whispers followed me, haunting me wherever I go. And sometimes, late at night, I still hear them, soft and distant, calling out to me, begging for someone to help them find peace. So if you ever pass by that old Victorian house on Willow Street, heed the warnings and don't stop to listen to the whispers. For once you do, you may find yourself drawn into a darkness from which there's no escape. Story the end. Story number five. It was a chilly November evening when I found myself alone at home curled up on the couch with a cup of tea and a good book. The house was quiet, the only sound the occasional crackle of the fireplace. My parents had gone out for the night, leaving me with strict instructions to lock the doors and stay inside. I had no problem with that. I was content in my little bubble of warmth and comfort. As I settled deeper into the couch, the wind howled outside, rattling the windows. I tried to ignore the creeping sense of unease that came with the darkness. The house had always felt a little off at night, but I chalked it up to my overactive imagination. After all, I was 16, not a child anymore. I turned a page, losing myself in the story when I heard it, a faint thump from somewhere in the house. My heart skipped a beat, and I set the book down, 
straining to listen. It was probably just the old pipes I told myself, or maybe the wind shifting something outside. But then I heard it again, a soft thud followed by an unsettling silence. Against my better judgment, I stood up and tiptoed toward the staircase. My parents had always warned me about going upstairs alone at night, especially when they weren't home. There was something about the shadows that clung to the corners of the upstairs hallway that made my skin crawl. But curiosity gnawed at me. As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I felt a chill run down my spine. The house, the house was darker up there, the shadows deeper and more menacing. I swallowed hard and called out, Hello? Is anyone up there? My voice echoed eerily against the walls, swallowed by the silence. Nothing. Just the rhythmic creaking of the house settling. I hesitated, but the thumping sound tugged at my curiosity, pulling me upward. Each step felt heavier than the last, my heart pounding in my chest like a drum. I reached the landing and glanced around, trying to pierce the gloom with my gaze. The hallway stretched before me, long and narrow, lined with doors that led to empty rooms. I was about to turn back when I heard it again, a soft, deliberate thump, this time coming from beneath the stairs. The small space was typically used for storage, filled with boxes and forgotten toys. My heart raced as I approached, every instinct screaming at me to retreat. Is anyone there? I called, my voice barely above a whisper. Silence hung in the air, thick and oppressive. Just as I was about to turn away, the thump came again, louder this time, like something or someone was trying to get out. I felt a mix of fear and anger. If this is a joke, it's not funny, I shouted, my voice echoing off the walls. In response, the thumping stopped. An eerie quiet enveloped the space, and I stood frozen, waiting. I reached for the door to the storage area, my hand trembling. The handle felt cold beneath my palm, and I hesitated, my heart racing in my chest. Summoning every ounce of courage, I swung the door open. The darkness inside was thick, and I could barely make out the shapes of boxes piled haphazardly. I stepped inside, the air stale and musty, and peered into the gloom. There was nothing, just a mess of forgotten memories and discarded things. I was about to step back when I caught a glimpse of movement in the corner. I squinted into the darkness and froze. A shadow flickered, barely perceptible but undeniably there. My blood ran cold as the shape began to shift, coiling and twisting like smoke. Who's there? I demanded, panic rising in my throat. The shadow didn't respond. Instead, it inched closer, its form growing more defined. I stumbled back, heart pounding in my ears, and suddenly the shadow lunged forward, seh, darting into the hallway. I gasped and bolted after it, fear propelling me forward as I raced down the hall. I burst into my parents' room, slamming the door behind me and locking it. My mind raced as I fumbled for my phone, desperately trying to catch my breath. The idea of being alone in the house with something lurking in the shadows filled me with dread. Suddenly, I heard a soft tapping at the door. My heart leapt into my throat. Please let it be my imagination, I muttered to myself. I pressed my back against the wall, holding my breath. Let me in, a soft voice whispered, barely audible but unmistakable. It sounded like a child, sweet and innocent, yet there was something wrong about it, something that sent chills racing down my spine. Go away! I shouted, my voice breaking. I didn't know what was out there, but it didn't feel safe. Please let me in. I'm scared, the voice pleaded, and I could hear a faint whimper, er, the kind that tugged at my heartstrings. But I didn't trust it. I knew better than to open that door. I waited in silence, listening for any sign of movement, but the tapping stopped, leaving an unsettling quiet in its wake. Minutes passed, and I finally felt brave enough to peek through the crack in the door. The hallway was empty. My heart raced, and I took a deep breath, slowly unlocking the door. I swung it open just a crack, peering out cautiously. Nothing. The shadows loomed, but they were just shadows now, the hall bathed in faint moonlight. I stepped out, my mind racing as I scanned the area. The air felt heavier, like something was watching me. I turned to head back to my room when I heard a giggle, soft and airy, echoing through the hallway. It sent a chill down my spine. I spun around, but the corridor remained empty. Who's there? I called out but my voice echoed back at me, unanswered. Come play with me, the voice sang out, a childlike lilt that was both enchanting and terrifying. It was coming from the staircase again, that same spot where the thumping had started. Despite every warning bell in my head, I found myself walking toward the stairs. The shadows shifted as I descended, and I felt a magnetic pull toward that dark corner. As I reached the bottom, I caught a glimpse of a small figure crouching beneath the stairs. It was a little girl her hair tangled and her dress dirty. 
She looked up at me with wide, empty eyes that sent a wave of nausea through me. Will you play with me? She asked, her voice sweet yet laced with something sinister. No, I shouted, stumbling backward. Get away from me. She didn't move. She simply stared, her gaze piercing through me. Please, she said softly, a hint of sadness in her voice. I'm all alone. I need a friend. In that moment, I realized the truth. This wasn't just a child lost in the dark. It was something else entirely. A shadow that had taken the form of a little girl. A trickster in the night. Leave me alone, I yelled, turning and sprinting back up the stairs, racing through the house toward the front door. I threw it open and bolted outside, the cold night air biting at my skin. I didn't stop running until I reached the street, gasping for breath, my heart pounding in my chest. The shadows in my home loomed behind me, and I could still hear the faint echo of that innocent voice calling for me. I spent the rest of the night at a friend's house, shaking and terrified. I told them what happened, but they brushed it off as my imagination. The next day, I returned home with my parents, my heart heavy with dread. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still lurking in the shadows, waiting for me. And even now, every time I hear the faintest thump in the night, I remember the girl beneath the stairs, her empty eyes and sweet voice forever echoing in the darkness. Story number six. My name is Sarah, and I have a story that still haunts me, one I can't shake no matter how hard I try. It all began two years ago when I was working as a summer camp counselor in the heart of the woods. The camp was nestled beside a pristine lake, surrounded by towering trees and the kind of silence that swallows sounds whole. At first, it felt like paradise, but as the summer wore on, something shifted in the air. One evening, we were gathered around the campfire, sharing ghost stories and roasting marshmallows. The mood was light until an older counselor, Jake, decided to share the tale of the lost child. He spoke of a young boy who had disappeared in those very woods decades ago, leaving only whispers of his laughter echoing among the trees. Some claimed they had seen him playing by the lake. Others said he roamed the woods at night, forever searching for something he could never find. Legend has it, Jake said, leaning closer to the firelight, his eyes gleaming with mischief. If you hear his laughter, it means he's trying to lead you somewhere, somewhere you don't want to go. We all laughed nervously, brushing off the tale as just that, a story. But that night, as I lay in my cabin, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me from the dark woods just beyond my window. A few days later, during a nature hike with the campers, one of the girls, Lily, wandered off the trail. I immediately called for her to come back, but she just giggled and ran deeper into the woods. Lily, I shouted, panic creeping into my voice. The other campers started to murmur, and I could feel the tension rising. I followed her voice, pushing through the underbrush, calling her name. After what felt like an eternity, I stumbled into a small clearing and saw her standing there, looking up at something. My heart sank as I approached her, ready to scold her for wandering off, but when I reached her side, I froze. She was staring up at a tree where a strange, flickering light danced in the branches, illuminating the area around us. Lily, what are you doing? I asked, my voice shaking. She turned to me, her eyes wide with wonder. Look, Sarah, it's the lost child. He's playing with me. I glanced around, but all I saw were the trees swaying gently in the wind. There's no one here, sweetie. I said, trying to keep my voice calm. We need to go back to the group. Lily pouted, but reluctantly followed me back. As we made our way through the woods, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The laughter from the campfire echoed in my mind, and I felt a strange chill in the air as if the forest was alive with unseen eyes. That night, after lights out, I was sitting on my bed, lost in thought, when I heard the laughter. It was faint but unmistakable, echoing through the trees outside the cabin. I rushed to the window and peered into the darkness, but all I saw were the flickering shadows of branches. My heart raced as the laughter grew louder, weaving through the silence like a haunting melody. I decided to step outside, drawn by the sound, though every instinct told me to stay put. As I stepped onto the porch, the laughter stopped abruptly, replaced by an eerie silence that wrapped around me like a fog. I hesitated, then moved toward the woods, the moonlight casting long shadows on the ground. Suddenly, I saw a figure darting between the trees. My heart raced. Was it Lily? I called her name, but the only answer was silence. The figure disappeared, and all I could hear was the rustle of leaves and the faint whispers of the wind. I turned to go back, but that's when I saw him, a young boy standing at the edge of the trees. He looked lost, 
his clothes tattered and dirty, with wide, sorrowful eyes that seemed to penetrate my very soul. Help me, he whispered, his voice soft and melodic. I felt a surge of compassion for this lost child, but then the warning from Jake's story echoed in my mind. Something wasn't right. I took a step back, ready to run, but the boy pointed deeper into the woods. Come play with me. I want to show you, he urged, his eyes sparkling with a strange light. No, I can't, I yelled, fear gripping my heart. I need to go back. Suddenly, the boy's expression changed, his eyes darkening with a mix of anger and sadness. You can't leave me, he screamed. And in that moment, the air around me grew heavy, suffocating. The laughter returned, echoing all around me, swirling through the trees like a storm. I turned and fled, the boy's cries ringing in my ears as I dashed back to the cabin, the whispers of the forest growing louder and more chaotic. I burst through the door and slammed it shut behind me, my heart pounding. I collapsed onto the floor, gasping for breath, the laughter fading into the distance. The next morning, I woke to the sound of frantic voices. The camp director was gathering everyone in the main lodge, and I quickly joined the others. My stomach sank as I listened to the director explain that Lily had gone missing. My heart raced as I recalled her wandering off, her laughter blending with the shadows of the woods. Panic spread through the camp as counselors scoured the area, calling her name, but there was no sign of her. As the hours dragged on, I felt a deepening sense of dread. My encounter with the lost child weighed heavily on my conscience. I knew the woods had taken her, just as they had taken him. That evening, we gathered around the campfire again, but the mood was somber. The camp director spoke about how the local authorities would come to help search for Lily, but deep down, I felt hopeless. I couldn't shake the image of the boy's pleading eyes, nor could I forget the laughter that had drawn me into the darkness. Days turned into weeks, and despite the extensive search efforts, Lily was never found. The camp closed early, the joy of summer overshadowed by the mystery of her disappearance. I returned home, but the guilt followed me like a shadow, and I was haunted by the whispers of the lost child. To this day, I can't help but wonder what happened that night, what darkness lurks within those woods, and if the boy I saw was truly lost or something far more sinister. I still hear the laughter sometimes echoing through the silence of the night, and it sends chills down my spine. If you ever find yourself near Willow Street, don't stray too close to the woods. For once you hear the laughter, you may find yourself forever lost in the shadows. Story number seven. It was supposed to be a weekend getaway, just me and a few friends looking to escape the chaos of city life. We found a rental online, Millstone Manor, a sprawling old estate surrounded by dense woods. The photos were enticing, showcasing its rustic charm and rich history. But what caught my attention was the price. It was too low to be believable, which made it all the more appealing. We booked it without a second thought, eager for adventure. When we arrived, I could feel the weight of the place pressing down on us. The manor was magnificent yet foreboding, with tall windows staring out like hollow eyes and vines creeping up the walls. We parked our car and unloaded our bags, our laughter echoing off the stone facade. But as we stepped inside, an unnatural chill settled in the air. The interior was a mix of grand and eerie, with antique furniture draped in dust covers and faded photographs lining the walls. The moment we crossed the threshold, the atmosphere shifted. The air was thick, heavy with secrets long buried. My friends seemed to notice it too, exchanging uneasy glances as we explored our temporary home. That evening, we gathered in the living room, cracking jokes to lighten the mood. But as night fell, the house began to settle, creaking and groaning as if awakening from a deep slumber. I felt a shiver run down my spine, a sense that we were not alone. I'll go grab some firewood, I said, trying to break the tension. I stepped outside, and the cool night air hit me like a wave. The woods loomed around the manor, dark and silent. As I gathered logs, I heard a soft rustling behind me. I turned, but nothing was there. I shrugged it off as my imagination and hurried back inside. We lit the fireplace, its warm glow flickering across the room, but the uneasy feeling lingered. As we settled into our chairs, I noticed a door at the far end of the room that I hadn't seen before. It was slightly ajar, and I felt an inexplicable pull to it. Hey, what's behind that door? I asked, pointing. My friends turned to look. Curiosity peaked. I don't know, said Mark, one of my friends. Why don't you check it out? Fine, I will, I said, standing up. I walked over, the floorboards creaking beneath my weight. As I pushed the door open, a rush of stale air hit me. It led to a narrow staircase that spiraled down into darkness. Dare you to go down there, 
one of my friends shouted playfully, but I hesitated. I glanced back at them, their faces lit by the firelight, uncertainty etched in their features. Let's not go down there, I said, suddenly feeling foolish. It's probably just a cellar or something. But the pull was stronger now, and before I knew it, I was descending the stairs, one shaky step at a time. The air grew colder, and the light from the fire faded behind me. When I reached the bottom, I flicked on my phone's flashlight, illuminating the damp stone walls. The room was small, filled with old crates and dust-covered furniture. But in the corner, something caught my eye. A large, ornate mirror, its glass cracked and cloudy. As I approached, I noticed something strange. My reflection didn't match my movements. It lingered for a moment longer before mimicking me, as if waiting for permission to move. A chill ran down my spine. Guys, come check this out. I called, my voice echoing through the dark. They didn't respond. I turned back, confused, but saw only the shadows closing in behind me. I climbed back up the stairs, my heart racing. When I reached the living room, my friends were gone. The fire was dying and an oppressive silence enveloped the room. Guys, I called, panic rising in my chest. Where are you? I rushed through the manor, checking every room, but it was empty. Just as I was about to lose hope, I heard a faint whisper echoing from the basement. Help us. Come back. Against my better judgment, I followed the sound back down the stairs. My heart thudded in my chest as I reached the bottom, the air thickening around me. The whisper grew louder, more urgent. Help us. Find us. I turned to the mirror, my breath hitching. I could see shadows moving behind the glass, figures writhing and reaching out as if they were trapped inside. My skin prickled as I realized that the mirror wasn't just a reflection. It was a portal, holding captive whatever souls were lost within. Guys! I shouted, fear choking my voice. I stumbled backward, the whispers morphing into desperate cries. Suddenly I felt hands grip my shoulders and I spun around to find my friends standing behind me, pale and terrified. Sarah, what's happening? Mark gasped, his eyes wide with fear. I, I don't know, I stammered, looking back at the mirror. I think it's connected to the whispers. As we stood there, the temperature dropped and a cold wind swept through the basement. The mirror vibrated and the whispers grew deafening. Join us, they cried, the voices rising and falling like a terrible chorus. In that moment, we knew we had to leave. We turned to flee, but the door slammed shut, trapping us inside. Panic surged through me as I banged on the door, but it wouldn't budge. The shadows in the mirror grew darker, swirling around the edges as if trying to break free. Stay together, I shouted, trying to keep my friends close. We huddled together, our backs against the wall, as the whispers grew louder, drowning out our thoughts. Help us. Help us. Suddenly, the mirror shattered, sending shards of glass flying through the air. We screamed as a force surged from the fragments, pulling at us like a vortex. In that instant, we felt our feet lift off the ground, the darkness consuming us. Just as we thought we would be lost forever, the door burst open and light flooded the basement. A figure stood in the doorway a man with a haunting expression and eyes filled with sorrow. Run, he shouted. Get out of here. We didn't need to be told twice. We bolted past him up the stairs and out into the night, the whispers fading behind us. We stumbled into the cool air, gasping for breath, our hearts racing. We never looked back as we piled into the car, driving away from Millstone Manor without a word. The shadows lingered in my mind long after we left, and I still hear the whispers sometimes, echoing through the silence of my dreams. To this day, I can't shake the feeling that we left something behind in that house. Something dark and restless, trapped between worlds. And if you ever find yourself near Millstone Manor, heed my warning. Don't listen to the whispers. They might just lead you to a darkness from which you can never return. Story number eight. It was the autumn of 2019 when I first heard about Oakwood Asylum, a decrepit mental hospital on the outskirts of my town, long abandoned and cloaked in urban legends. I had always been a thrill seeker, drawn to the eerie tales that swirled around this place like the fallen leaves around its wrought iron gates. When I heard my friends whisper about an urban exploration trip to Oakwood, I jumped at the chance, fueled by equal parts curiosity and adrenaline. The day of our adventure was chilly, the kind of cold that creeps into your bones. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows through the trees, we gathered at the edge of the property. The entrance loomed before us, a twisted mouth of rusted metal and crumbling stone. Despite the warnings I had heard about the asylum, stories of patients lost to madness, of shadowy figures flitting through the halls, I stepped forward without a second thought, feeling the thrill of the unknown wash over me. 
As we crossed the threshold, the air inside felt different, thicker, almost electric. My heart raced as I shone my flashlight around the dusty foyer. The remnants of a long-forgotten world greeted us, peeling paint, broken furniture, and the musty scent of decay. My friends laughed nervously, their voices echoing against the crumbling walls. We had entered a place that time had forgotten, and I couldn't help but feel a rush of excitement. We decided to split up. Classic horror movie mistake. I teamed up with Jake, a fellow adrenaline junkie. We wandered deeper into the asylum, our flashlights flickering across graffiti-covered walls and shattered glass. We explored the remnants of the old patient rooms, each more unsettling than the last. My breath quickened when I noticed the handprints smeared across the glass, dried, and yellowed, as if someone had pressed their palm against it in a desperate plea. Did you see that? Jake whispered, and I felt a chill race down my spine. See what? I asked, though I didn't really want to know. He pointed toward a darkened hallway, shadows dancing along the walls. My instincts screamed at me to turn back, but the thrill of exploration outweighed my fear. We crept down the corridor, the sound of our footsteps swallowed by the oppressive silence. Suddenly, a low groan echoed from a nearby room, a sound so human yet filled with sorrow that I froze in place. Jake's eyes widened, and we shared a glance filled with unspoken terror. It's probably just the wind, he said, though neither of us believed it. With our hearts pounding, we approached the door. I reached for the handle, the cold metal sending a jolt of fear through me. As I pulled it open, the hinges creaked ominously, revealing a dark room. Inside, the faint outline of a figure stood motionless in the corner, its back turned to us. Hello? I called out, my voice barely a whisper. The figure didn't move, a sense of dread washed over me. Something wasn't right. We took a cautious step inside. Uh, and the moment our flashlights illuminated the figure, we stumbled back in horror. It was a mannequin, its limbs bent at unnatural angles, clothed in a tattered patient gown, its face obscured by a grotesque mask. Just a stupid prop, Jake breathed, but I could tell he was trying to convince himself more than me. We laughed nervously, but I could feel the unease settling in my stomach. Just as we turned to leave, a loud bang echoed from the other end of the hall, a sound that shattered the tense silence. I jumped, my heart racing. We should find the others, I suggested, but Jake was already backing away, had his face pale. As we made our way back, a cold draft swept through the hallway, chilling me to the bone. I glanced back, and for a split second, I thought I saw a figure watching us from the shadows. I shook my head, trying to dispel the vision, but my pulse quickened. The stories of Oakwood flooded my mind. Patients who had never left, souls trapped in despair. When we finally reunited with the others, I noticed their faces were ghostly pale. Did you hear that? Clara, one of my friends, asked, her voice trembling. There's something in the basement. Before I could respond, the lights flickered, plunging us into darkness. A sense of panic rose as we fumbled for our flashlights, the atmosphere thick with dread. We need to get out of here, I urged, but a heavy silence fell over us and I could see the fear etched on their faces. Then we heard it. A low, mournful wail that reverberated through the walls. It was the sound of pure agony echoing through the corridors. It was unmistakable. Someone, or something, was crying. Let's go, I shouted, adrenaline coursing through me. We sprinted down the hallway, our footsteps pounding against the floor as the wail grew louder, more desperate, almost as if it were pursuing us. I risked a glance back and saw a shadow darting between the walls, a figure too swift to comprehend. We barreled through the exit, gasping for air as we stumbled into the cool night. The asylum stood behind us, ominous and silent. As we regrouped, I felt a sense of relief wash over me, but it was short-lived. Did you see it? Jake panted, eyes wide with terror. Something was chasing us. I nodded, my heart still racing. We need to leave. Now. We dashed through the overgrown path, the chilling wail still echoing in my mind. As we reached the road, I glanced back one last time. The asylum loomed in the distance, a dark silhouette against the moonlit sky. For a moment, I thought I saw a figure standing at the entrance, watching us. Let's go! Clara cried, pulling me away, and I didn't argue. We jumped into my car, and I drove away, leaving Oakwood Asylum in the rearview mirror. But even as we sped away, I could feel the weight of its presence, an invisible force tugging at my thoughts. The stories I'd heard began to take root in my mind, and I couldn't shake the feeling that the asylum had claimed a part of me. Weeks passed, but the nightmares began to haunt me. Visions of the wailing figure, the mannequin, the feeling of being watched. 
I learned that Oakwood Asylum had been home to countless souls, lost to time and despair, their cries lingering like echoes in the dark. And though I left the asylum behind, I knew it would never truly let me go. Story the end.